Roberto, Francesco, okay, Thank everything you. is fixed. Uh, we are live, so we can we can go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank All you, right. Marco. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be with you today. And uh, the topic, it's uh, suborbital. Uh, before we start, I wanted to share with you a picture. Uh, that's a view of Earth seen from space. And uh, obviously, I cannot not underline uh, the beauty of Italy in general and uh, the, best, the, the perfect position of uh, Puglia. Uh, it's a perfect spot to do suborbital flights. Uh, that is one of the reasons for which back in 2014, when I received the original invitation from Polytechnic of Bari, I immediately accepted. Uh, and uh, since then, uh, every single opportunity to work with you, um, Francesco, it's a, it's a great opportunity. Thank you for everything that you are doing. It's very, very important uh, to um, involve the, the young generations, uh, therefore the university, to what will be uh, the future of humanity, that is space. Now, um, going to the point to the subject of today, suborbital. Suborbital, um, when we say suborbital, sometimes we have the impression to say um, a, a, a second class type of um, initiative. We are used to consider space uh, that is orbital as the priority. Uh, satellites are orbiting Earth. Um, the International Space Station is orbiting Earth. So when, when we use the word suborbital, that from a technical standpoint, suborbital means getting outside the atmosphere, but uh, not with enough energy to uh, enter a full orbit of the planet. So somehow it gives the impression to be um, a, a, a something less important than orbital. In fact, it's the opposite. Suborbital is the very first step, is the most important step to go to space. And uh, uh, we uh, often, uh, in recent times, we as correlate the word uh, suborbital with uh, something that uh, can be very promising for Grottaglie, that is uh, Spaceship 2, that's a beautiful picture spaceship to vehicle that is uh, in this picture about to get to uh, space, not to orbit, does not have the energy to enter full orbit, but to get to space and come back. So um, in a nutshell, that, that's, that's a suborbital flight. You take off from a runway, let's say Grottaglie, you get to above the atmosphere, um, 100 kilometers in the international definition, 80 kilometers in the US definition, regardless, let's say 101 kilometers to be on the safe side. So you are from a technical standpoint, you are in space and then you come back and uh, land again uh, on a runway, for example, um, Grottaglie. Now, why um, when we launch a rocket, uh, we need uh, a spaceport like Kennedy Space Center or like um, Baikonur in Kazakhstan? Well, because when you, you push uh, a rocket into orbit, uh, in the classical um, configuration of a rocket, uh, the first stage or uh, all, all the stages except what gets to orbit uh, is falling down on Earth. So if we make an assumption to, um, to have a rocket uh, um, in Italy and uh, um, go to space with that rocket, that would not be doable because there will be pieces is falling on uh, uh, Germany, France, de depending on the orbit. That would not work well. Now, the future, uh, what is called the new space, uh, what is going on in the US, especially, but uh, everywhere in the world, uh, where there is a, a, now a, 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 a change in, uh, in, in the boundary conditions. Um, suborbital, especially, is going from um, something that is needed, uh, uh, for example, any, any astronaut that uh, today is going to space, 
as the same type of sequence. So you, you uh, for example, the Soyuz is a 55 meter tall rocket. Uh, um, you are on top of it, uh, the engines lift off, and then all the stages fall uh, back on Earth while the capsules, is get, capsules get into orbit. Now, this is changing. This is changing very rapidly uh, for a number of reasons. And uh, especially uh, for uh, the effort uh, of a specific company, a specific person, the company SpaceX and the person is Elon Musk. Uh, Elon Musk was able to prove something what, that was unconceivable, that is the landing of the first stage. In this picture, you see two beautiful landings of uh, um, the first stages of the Falcon 9 Heavy, first time in history. And uh, again, um, starting from 1957, when the Sputnik was launched, uh, throughout the years, it was considered unconceivable, impossible, a, a full landing of the first stage, in fact, Elon Musk changed history by proving through artificial intelligence, very complicated uh, algorithm of artificial intelligence, <laughs> he is landing the first stages. Now, next step for Elon Musk will be to land uh, the entire rocket. <clears throat> but that is not yet a reality. Uh, today, he tried again, uh, this morning, 8 a.m., uh, Eastern Standard Time, he tried with uh, serial number, let me find a picture here, serial number 11, this picture was serial number 10, um, serial number 11 took off from Texas, went to uh, 10 kilometers and uh, unfortunately crashed upon landing. Now, <clears throat> this picture was the previous serial number, serial number 10, and he did uh, land. Now, um, all, all, the, all the previous serial numbers, one to nine, they are all uh, destroyed. That, that's uh, a, the new attempt, the new system, the new way of doing space that uh, Elon Musk specifically, but uh, in general, the private uh, um, uh, actors are putting in place. See, differently from the past, uh, um, the, the risk of the uh, new private actors that are taking is very high, but uh, it's very rewarding because uh, they, they, they push the border of technology much faster. Now, everything that is currently going on is uh, fully applicable to the world uh, suborbital and will be a game changer because uh, once you prove and uh, you, you make the landing of the first stage a given, then you no longer have the need of uh, getting to spe special places to have spaceports. So going back to Puglia, you could uh, uh, take off with uh, a starship, get to orbit, come back and land uh, in Puglia. That will be a game changer and uh, again, it's not the future, it's uh, an a, a ongoing effort uh, with uh, an already partial success with Elon Musk uh, landing the first stage of the Falcon 9. Now, it's not only Elon Musk, that is a uh, is, uh, um, counterpart, um, Jeff Bezos, with um, Blue Origin and New Shepard. This is a... Uh, a um, very similar concept, the New Shepard is lifting off, getting to space above 100 kilometers and uh, landing. Now, the difference between uh, um, the, the SpaceX effort uh, and uh, Blue Origin, and uh, Blue Origin is, uh, is primarily an elevator. It goes up to 100 kilometers and back. It never tried to reach orbital speed. The case in the, instead of the, the, the Falcon 9 is different. The Falcon 9 is used to put satellites uh, in orbit and then they reverse trajectory, come back, slow down and land. 
So in a nutshell, suborbital, it's uh, in reality the future. It's uh, um, anything that uh, we will do in the future will be primarily around uh, the technology that are pivoting around the, 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 the concept of a suborbital. Now, going back in history, <clears throat> um, that is a V2, um, the, the very first time we, uh, human technology was able to, to prove that uh, uh, objects can get outside the atmosphere. And uh, if you look, on the left, on the right, it's it's uh, it's it's very very strange. The V two and the Starship uh, have a similar similar shape. In fact, anything that uh, we have done in the last sixty years, um, primarily, have been focusing on uh, uh, the misconception that uh, again suborbital was just. Um, important part, but uh, nothing more than that, an important uh, uh, way to get things to space, but not useful on its own. In fact, suborbital, it's uh, by itself the most important part of getting to space. Um, this is uh, another, um, the, 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 the word suborbital can be seen from two different perspectives. One is the rocket that is going to space with the first stage pushing and in the new approach of Elon Musk capable to land. The other is with the aircraft that is becoming a spacecraft. So that is another key uh, part of our discussion today. I, I, I want to clearly underline the distinction between aerospace and space. Anything that is uh, within the 100 kilometers of the atmosphere, in reality, the atmosphere is much bigger, but uh, then the density is so low that it's insignificant. When we talk about anything that flies, let's use 100 kilometers as a reference. So in, in, in the atmosphere, the, the forces is uh, aerothermodynamics. When you are in space, like the International Space Station, 400 kilometers, like um, low Earth orbits, uh, 2,000 kilometers or whatever, that uh, is the inertia principle principle that is ruling. So uh, we we usually confuse uh, within the word space everything together. In reality, they, they belong to a totally different. Um, domain from a physical standpoint, operational standpoint, a technological standpoint. Now, going back to our topic, suborbital, we have uh, two different approaches. We have uh, um, the Elon Musk approach with uh, the rockets that uh, uh, have the capability to land. And we have uh, another possible approach, the Virgin Galactic approach of aircraft that are becoming spacecrafts. This picture, it's uh, a, a one of the most beautiful aircraft ever made, is the X-15. That was uh, 1950, the original program, and uh, he, 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 he now is obviously retired, but he was, uh, he was uh, uh, one of the first way for, for us to get to space. We all know that uh, Yuri Gagarin was uh, the first human being to go to space. We do not know uh, so well who was the first to go to space twice. It was John Walker. And he was not uh, an astronaut, as we define astronaut flying on a rocket, uh, but he was flying the X-15. John Walker, he went to space two different flights. What, what is the difference between that? That's another image of the beautiful X-15. And another, another uh, key moment uh, that was an error was when in the US, um, NACA, NACA was uh, the, uh, the, the organization in the US that was uh, in charge for um, 
uh, getting aircraft into spacecraft. And then in uh, 1958, uh, I believe was Eisenhower decided uh, uh, soon after the Sputnik to close NACA and to start NASA. In reality, NACA and NASA had uh, two different missions. They were not one uh, taking the place of the other. They should have remained both alive. NACA was aircraft becoming spacecraft. NASA was rockets. Now, that is, as a curiosity, uh, a list of the first astronauts, Alan Shepard, US, um, then Grissom. But uh, the first one, if you look number three and number four, the first uh, that uh, went to space twice, only one month, one to the other, was jo Joseph Walker on uh, the X-15. And that's our atmosphere. Um, I, I like to call it an atmosphere that could be uh, like one step after the other, 20, 50, 85, 120. We do not have the 100, again, that's the karma line. Usually we, we, we consider uh, 100 kilometers as the line above which anyone that, that gets above that is an astronaut. Now Virgin Galactic is instead using 80 kilometers regardless. In reality, up to 20 kilometers is uh, the aeronautical band. From 20 to 50 is still uh, very dense the atmosphere um, from 50 to 85 there it's a, a, a another um, transition area it's very uh, difficult if not impossible to have level flights between 50 and 85 so um, what is uh, the difference between uh, uh, the aeronautical and future evolutions of the uh, aeronautical part and uh, space it's uh, in between 50 and 85. Now, uh, that going back to the most, the, the conventional definition of suborbital, and uh, to summarize what we have said so far, we are in Grottaglie, we have a uh, um, Virgin Galactic with Spaceship 2. In a future evolution of the concept, uh, you can take off from a runway, you can get to space, and then above 100 kilometers, and then come back and land. Now, in doing that, what is the, uh, the game changer? Why suborbital is so important? Because uh, once you land in such a profile, you can refuel and go back in space. The word reusability, it's uh, very closely connected with the concept of suborbital. The word reusability, it is what is changing from the classical approach to space and the new space. Reusability is the key word that Elon Musk with SpaceX is focusing on to create uh, the technical opportunity of the landing of the first stage. The reusability, it's, uh, it's, more not, it, it's, more, it's easier to correlate with uh, aircraft. We all know that uh, when we uh, take off from Fiumicino and we land uh, to Bari, the, the aircraft uh, is refueled uh, and then it goes back to Rome. All aircraft are reusable. So, uh, rockets are not reusable, at least uh, until now. Now, I was very surprised. Uh, Elon Musk is a genius. Uh, I, I never thought you could uh, uh, reuse rockets. The reusability of a rocket, uh, it's a little bit uh, of a, um, a, a contradicting concept because the rocket have engines that uh, by definition are pushing up. And uh, if you use the rockets to slow down the descent, it is possible, but the center of gravity is in the wrong place. So physics is against you. However, now, uh, we have artificial intelligence that uh, can do what human brain and uh, human beings cannot do. And that exactly what Elon Musk uh, he, he tried to do and succeeded. 
he is capable, I, I call it, uh, make it uh, rockets into aeronautical objects, uh, making rockets reusable. Um, for the future, we, we will have uh, bot options. We will have uh, um, the continuation of what Elon Musk is doing, that is the uh, landing and reusability of rockets. Uh, and we also have uh, aircraft evolving into spacecraft. In Italy, with uh, um, Grottaglie, with, uh, we, we, we engaged Virgin Galactic in order to pursue this second uh, path that in reality for me is the, the, the most promising aircraft that will evolve into spacecraft. Now, just a few words on why that is uh, um, a, an opportunity. Um, th there are many reasons, but one of the most uh, easily understood is that once you have an aircraft that is capable to get to 100 kilometers, you are outside the atmosphere. So from that aircraft, you can launch satellites into space with minimum effort. So the, the accessing space using aircraft that are evolving in, into spacecraft will make it uh, um, uh, based on the concept of reusability will make it uh, uh, the cost uh, one tenth, one hundredth of the today's cost. So the, the, the future of accessing space is uh, uh, pivoting around the concept of reusability with the two options, either aircraft that are evolving into spacecraft or rockets that are capable through, again, very complicated algorithm of artificial intelligence to return and land on a, on a on a, uh, on a runway or on a pad. Now, uh, going beyond uh, low Earth orbit, the scenario is different. And uh, if we think about going on the Moon or Mars, Elon Musk solution is the way to go. Aircraft uh, that would uh, have the uh, capability to get to those distances are for the moment unconceivable. So we will need uh, a, an Elon Musk uh, for the other configuration in order to resolve uh, the technical difficulties to taking off with uh, an aircraft from a runway on Earth and landing somehow on the moon. Um, just we have uh, still five minutes, so then I will leave to questions if there are any. But uh, uh, to complete the picture, uh, when we talk about our atmosphere, 20 kilometers, that is 60,000 feet, it's uh, where aircrafts are flying today. Between 20 and 50 kilometers is still uh, primarily um, aeronautics, uh, but uh, we, we are getting to the border. And uh, this is uh, the highest uh, uh, of a, a stratospheric balloon, 40 kilometers, with uh, Felix, um, this Austrian guy, that jumped. Uh, to prove the survivability of uh, a high altitude jump. It's still on YouTube. It's, uh, it's incredible. Um, it was, uh, uh, that, that's, uh, that's the edge of the aeronautical band, 40 kilometers, that is 120,000 feet. Then uh, balloon, stratospheric balloon, do not have the capability to get uh, much above that. That's a beautiful picture taken from the International Space Station. And uh, you, you, you can see uh, slices of the atmosphere. I call it steps. And uh, suborbital, oh, by the way, when, when we use the word uh, suborbital, not necessarily uh, have to limit ourselves to 100 kilometers or thereabout. Uh, you can take off, go to 1,000, 10,000 kilometers and come back. For example, when um, in the US they did the, the testing of uh, a, a new capsule, uh, Orion, it was a suborbital flight, but was up to 6,000 kilometers. So the, the word suborbital do not necessarily um, constrain to a specific altitude, but uh, 
when you say suborbital, by definition, you have to be above, um, do you have to be in space? Despite there could be the debate whether space is the 80 or 100 kilometers, let's say 100, but then you can go as high as possible. The only, uh, const the, the only difference between orbital and suborbital is that you do not close a full um, <clears throat> cycle around the planet. This is uh, just again to uh, complete the discussion. A, con a European concept that I don't like is called uh, IXV, and uh, that in theory, it's a suborbital technology demonstrator, is lifting off um, from a spaceport in Kourou, getting to space, and then uh, returning, landing on Earth. I, I don't like the configuration because it's missing what I consider the most important piece on, 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 on such a architecture, that would be the wings. So um, we have seen before that the two main options, either rockets that uh, can land vertically the way SpaceX with Elon Musk is doing, or aircraft that uh, become spacecraft, go to space, come back and land. IXV is an hybrid. The, it's uh, it's uh, <coughs> somehow uh, resembly the tra re-entry trajectory of an aircraft, but does not have wings like a rocket. So that hybrid, uh, it's a third option, uh, neither aircraft that are evolving into spacecraft nor rockets that are capable of power landing. It's a third option, but it doesn't um, have uh, the advantages, neither the one or of the other. And uh, I, I, we, we, uh, we are right on time. Um, uh, just to close my speech and leave to questions, I share with you the image of my, um, I believe it's the second launch on the Soyuz 2005. The Soyuz is uh, uh, obviously designed to put uh, in orbit uh, astronauts. Um, there was a 1970, I forgot the year, uh, so the Soyuz did a suborbital flight when, uh, for, for, for a malfunction, could not get to space and uh, he performed a, a, a suborbital trajectory. Um, with that, I will leave to uh, questions and then I will take again the floor for three, four minutes for some conclusive remarks. If there are no questions, I will just go straight with the remarks. Back to... Um, to you, Francesca. Okay, thanks, Roberto. It was very interesting as usual. Uh, we can start now with the question time, if uh, we have uh, any question. Marco, can you give me a feedback on this? Okay, I have a question uh, just to start to Roberto. Um, uh, can Roberto comment, please, on the role of suborbital vehicles, uh, the role that uh, suborbital vehicles can uh, play, can have uh, in conducting uh, ed scientific experiments? Um, yes, thank you for the question. Today we 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 had a a, a discussion on suborbital, uh, but not uh, so much on the science and research that you can do. There are su suborbital is primarily launch and reentry, but you also have microgravity. Microgravity you the microgravity can, that that you can get depends on the altitude. For example, a typical um, suborbital uh, flight around 100 kilometers you can get between 10 to 15 20 20 minutes of microgravity and that is opening to the options to do microgravity research um, that will be another uh, will require another uh, full briefing but uh, yes there are the, 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 there is the microgravity window that is uh, opening for options. Um, what is nevertheless for me more important uh, than the, those 10, 15 minutes of microgravity is the research that you can do in aerothermodynamics. 
currently uh, it is about uh, it is six from 1957 even before if we if you think about the the, the first very first rockets uh, that we launch rockets in space and uh, since gagarin we we re-entry we have successful re-entries however the aerothermodynamics is still widely mis uh, unknown um, we have a number of accidents we have had a number of accidents especially the the, the columbia accident with the space shuttle in uh, 2003 that was clearly demonstrating that uh, there is still a lot that we need to learn uh, uh, the way uh, aircraft or spacecraft uh, re-entry into the atmosphere that's why the primary focus that i recommend uh, when we talk about the experimental part of suborbital is primarily for the re-entry and for the landing even if again you can get research opportunities for the launch and for the microgravity okay thanks alberto uh, we have a question from Maria Cinefra. Maria, please. So, thank you, Katia. Uh, I am Maria Cinefra. I have a question um, about the solution of aircraft uh, revolving in, um, in spacecraft. And uh, I'd like to know the, the greatest difficulties in uh, implementing this uh, solution if they are from uh, an aer aerodynamic point of view or a uh, structural point of view. I don't know if you have uh, more details. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a, a very interesting question. So um, aircraft and spacecraft started together almost uh, uh, at the same time, especially in the US. Um, Mercury program and the, the X-15 in fact, had the same test pilots. Neil Armstrong uh, was uh, at the same time NASA astronaut and the test pilot of the X-15. So why um, for the rockets we went a long way and for instead the aircraft, we um, after the X-15, uh, we have a long gap. Only recently, uh, Virgin Galactic is trying again to start with uh, the concept of uh, aircraft evolving spacecraft what is the, the what, what is most difficult is the engine is the uh, is the is the propulsive system so it, when you when you um, fly on an airbus or boeing from Fremichino to bari those are breathing engines but uh, breathing engines cannot uh, uh, do not have any chance uh, upper eye in the atmosphere. So, uh, in theory, uh, the, the rockets, the rockets use uh, carry um, hydrogen and oxygen. For example, uh, that was uh, in the uh, orange tank of the shuttle. Um, but if you if you remember the shuttle on the launch pad, um, uh, here it is. That's a picture. I don't know if you can see it. The shuttle, it's uh, the answer to your question. Um, you see the air, the shuttle is basically an aircraft, but uh, it could not, uh, if you just look at the size of the shuttle and the size of the tank, the tank is bigger than the shuttle. So when originally, when they designed the shuttle, they were not anticipating um, the, the rocket booster that are left and right. Those are the solid rocket booster. They had to install it because uh, despite being very powerful, the shuttle engines, they could not by themselves lift the weight of the propellant needed for the engine. So, uh, in, in other words, our engines are not powerful enough in order to get an aircraft into orbit. There is only one um, 
project that has been running for almost 20 years. Each year seems that the solution is around the corner, but uh, it is never that way. It's uh, the, the name is Skylon. The engine is a British engine, Sabre, and it's basically a breathing rocket. So it's uh, it's uh, it's a rocket uh, that is getting the oxygen real time from the air. Uh, in the shuttle, the other oxygen was in the tank. But again, oxygen is very heavy. So it's a, it's a catch 22. You, 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 you do not, in order to push, uh, in space, you need the oxygen, but the weight of the oxygen and obviously of the, of the hydrogen is increasing the need, uh, for, 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 for thrust. Huh? And there is no solution. Okay, so we we will have to have a, a a new type of propulsive system before we can get uh, to the point to have aircraft evolving into spacecraft. For the rocket, it was the other way around. For the rocket, uh, we started with a solution to the thrust to weight radio ratio with the fuel. So we. Elon Musk had to prove the landing, the vertical landing. That was also related to weight and fuel, because if you want to land using the engine, you have to have more fuel when you take off, that will mean more thrust. That's why one key element that Elon Musk had to resolve before getting where it is now is on the engines. Uh, one one of the most uh, brilliant technical solutions of SpaceX are the, the the engines. Now those engines, nevertheless, will not be capable, powerful enough, to resolve the problem uh, to make aircraft into spacecraft. Thank you for uh, your interesting, uh, very interesting answer. Okay, thanks. Now we have a question from Professor Avanzini. Giulio? Giulio, can you hear me? Okay, we, we are Mr. Giulio. Uh, we can now have uh, Professor Albino. Hi, hi, Roberto. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to hear you every, every time. Um, so uh, I have a very simple question. You have shown us that um, some US companies are doing a lot in suborbital flights. What are uh, Russian and China doing in the similar activities? That's also a very, very interesting question. They don't do much. Um, currently, um the, the the leading nation is the us not so much for the federal government but uh, for the uh, private initiatives first elon musk richard branson and then everybody else um, russia and china they do not have the same type of uh, scenario so they are trying to follow along on the classical approach. Uh, obviously, they are still extremely um, credible and powerful. China uh, primarily is putting a lot of effort, uh, but uh, it's all classical space. New space is only in the in the US. Now, talking about suborbital, suborbital is primarily new space. Suborbital, it's uh, in fact something suborbital meant as reusable. Uh, the word reusable, depending how you see it, may be an annoyance for the classical industry because it's, 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 it's more uh, interesting on the classical approach to make uh, many rockets uh, rather than to make one rocket uh, reusable. 
So the, the, it's uh, even the US, even in the US, it's not uh, a, a linear path for the new initiatives. There is uh, internal resistance <clears throat> even in the US because the classical industry is trying to oppose to uh, those new concepts. Uh, the classical industry is, uh, is very powerful and is trying to, 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 to slow down. So, um, seeing from the typical way to see it, you have US, China, Russia, um, and the question is, who is leading, who is following? In reality, new space is different. It's uh, the classical approach of the governments and uh, the new initiatives uh, based on innovation of the private entities. Thank you, Robert. Okay, we have uh, another question from uh, Professor Armenise, uh, who is unable to switch on uh, the, um, the microphone, so I have to read uh, his question. How many spaceports are working around the world at this uh, moment? How many? How many spaceports? Uh, spaceports. Yeah. There are many, especially in uh, in uh, in the US. Um, in the US, uh, the spaceports identify as spaceports are um, probably between ten and fifteen. Different in, in Europe is different. In in Europe, um, there are um, not many. But uh, what will make the difference is uh, uh, try to um, now I need to I need to carefully uh, define what we need to do. Um, and I, 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 I open small parentheses. Terry Breton, that is uh, um, the commissioner at the European Union, is a uh, is uh, dealing, he, he has space in his portfolio and he's uh, pushing Europe uh, um, to go um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and try to find uh, autonomous capability to access space. That's wrong. We will never make it. We are 10, 15 years behind, not the US again. The private initiatives in the US is different. So what we need to do is to uh, put together um, a, an effort, collaborative effort with the US private entities that have an interest to talk to us. And that is uh, um, the, the only solution that I see. So uh, identifying um, a, a runway as a spaceport is important, it's very important, uh, but it's uh, even more important uh, to give uh, a, a real meaning to that spaceport. Uh, and uh, in our case, what I have been pushing so far and I continue to push is the dialogue between Italy and Virgin Galactic. Uh, that is uh, a, a real option and a real opportunity because even for them, there is no better way than Italy, than Puglia specifically, uh, for geography and climate to do suborbital flights the way Virgin Galactic is doing. Okay, thanks, Roberto. Uh, next question is from Professor Avanzini. If Giulio is, uh, is present now, yeah. I hope okay. that now it works. Can you, can okay. you hear me? Okay. Can you hear? Okay, fine. So uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm sorry that um, uh, Dr. Vittori did not appreciate IXV because IXV is a very nice memory to me because it was my last work before leaving Politecnico di Torino 11 years ago. I've been working on the modeling of the parachute opening and the flying qualities of IXV during the hypersonic phase. So it was a very nice job. and. As a matter of fact, the configuration without wings was chosen for limiting the thermodynamic loads during the entry phase. And as a matter of fact, 
the European Space Agency confirmed that configuration with a new space rider, uh, which is expected to land with a parafoil using military technology in controlling the final descent and the terminal phase with the parafoil. So you have a reduction of thermal loads during entry, and in the end, you can, we hope to perform uh, a precise landing on the runway using a parafoil. And do you think this may be an option also for simplifying the configuration of suborbital uh, vehicles, or it's something you really don't like because it doesn't have wings? Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you for the question. I wrote an official letter to the ESA Director General to explain what not to do. What not to do is uh, not to confuse engineers with uh, aerothermodynamics that are, are similar but not identical. So the IXV is the perfect example of how to use uh, good uh, ingredients into something that uh, has no future. In fact, the IXV uh, proved to be just for itself. It went up, came, da came down, and uh, it did not not uh, add anything more than we knew before. The new versions are even worse because for the first one, IXV, you could uh, say, yes, well, um, we, the European industry had never an opportunity to do it. So a first time is important, okay. But now to re re repropose the IXV design into the space rider, it uh, will, will not add anything to, uh, to what we know. Neither will offer from an operational uh, standpoint or research standpoint anything else. What is worth? is that uh, Space Rider will, uh, uh, will not meet, not even, um, the, the um, uh, objectives that is defined for itself. It is, it is calling itself reusable. It will not be reusable. You cannot reuse uh, something that is coming down either on a parachute or a parafoil. So going back to our discussion today, there are two ways to do reusability. One is landing on a runway, but in order to land, you have to have enough efficiency to maneuver on the low, lower part of the atmosphere and land. The, the, the efficiency of a space shuttle was between four and five at landing. The efficiency of a space rider is at 0 0.8, 0 0.9. It will not uh, does not have uh, enough maneuverability in the lower part of the atmosphere, neither as the other option that is the power landing. So that configuration is an hybrid uh, that will not have the benefit of the one or, or the other, and there will be no usefulness in bringing along. I gave my recommendation uh, already more than once to change the design to go either for the landing using wings or using a power landing. The power, the, the, the landing under a parachute or parafoil, I have done it myself. I have landed twice uh, under a, a parachute with a Soyuz, and uh, it, it is not reusable what lands under a parachute. A parafoil, it's a little better. It will be refurbishable. That is another consideration. You can for sure take it back, disassemble, reassemble, but the, the cost of re refurbishing the, the, the space rider will uh, be uh, higher than make it new. Well, uh, I think that the efficiency of 0.8 is for the uh, basic configuration without the parafoil, and the parafoil is expected to limit the touchdown velocity below uh, in the order of something below one meter per second, which is relatively high, but not huge. Uh, so, as a matter of fact, they expect to, it to be reusable, as far as I know, but uh, I'm, I have no first-hand information, of course, just something from what is publicly available. So, I'm sure that your information is much more accurate than mine. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh...
The next uh, person in line for a question is uh, Giuseppe Tempesta. Giuseppe? Can you hear me, Giuseppe? Okay. The next one is uh, Lorenzo Santoro. Good evening. I am a PhD student and uh, I have um, a curiosity. Can you hear me? I can. Yes. Okay. I would like uh, to ask uh, what stresses act uh, on the human body when crossing the various layers of the atmosphere. Thank you. Uh, nothing. It's uh, absolutely... Um, you, know, you, you do not perceive any, any, any transition. Um, I, I launched three times, twice on board of the Soyuz, once on board of the shuttle. Uh, going up, it's, uh, it's very, very quick. It's eight minutes and 50 seconds to get from the surface to 200 kilometers. And the, the, you, you do not have any, any way to appreciate any of those transitions. In coming back, um, in coming back is uh, maybe um, different in the sense that uh, depending if you are on the Soyuz or on the shuttle. So let me, let me correct my, my, what you perceive from, from, from inside, uh, especially the capsule, the Soyuz, uh, is not so much um, the, the different layers of the atmosphere, but the different stages of the re-entry. For example, on the Soyuz, 100 kilo, 80 kilometers, it's uh, um, when you uh, perceive explosions um, that are taking apart um, the Soyuz, leaving only the command module where there are the astronauts free to intercept the atmosphere. Then uh, you, you start feeling the pressure of the atmosphere slowing down uh, the capsule. You, you are flying at 27,000 kilometers per hour, that is 80 kilo, eight kilometers per second, and you need to go down to 220 meters per second. Uh, at that point, then you have the parachute that's about 10 kilometers from the surface of the earth, the parachutes that parachute that opens. So you, you, you do feel um, the stages of the re-entry, but uh, that, that has nothing to do with the different layers of the atmosphere that are more uh, for a, a, a design standpoint of the aircraft or of the capsule than uh, anything that has relevance for the for the crew inside. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have uh, one more question from Elena Ancona. Elena, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, uh, as you were mentioning, the suborbital flight will uh, provide a, a huge amount of uh, new possibilities, uh, even not only in the research field, but also, for example, in the tourism or a lot of uh, different uh, areas. And uh, I was wondering if uh, uh, for the time being, it seems like everybody is waiting for people uh, like Elon Musk or private companies to do all the testing and go to all the um dirty dirty stuff uh and we like the the, the agencies and uh, the rest of the uh, organization are just waiting in the background uh to to get the final uh, uh product uh, when when it's available uh, is this just uh, 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 a sensation that we we get from <laughs> uh, from uh, do you think we we can get the the agencies and the organization more involved than they are at the at the moment i hope not because uh, uh, space it's a, it's a it's a new domain and uh, more than evolutionary we need a revolutionary approach that can only work 
if the, the designer is a genius. So um, Elon Musk is a genius, either crazy or genius, I do not know, but uh, he is making the difference. Um, for Virgin Galactic, uh, the genius uh, was Bert Rutan. He was the original designer uh, now, unfortunately, retired. That's why now Virgin Galactic has a number of delays. Unfortunately, it's not easy uh, to go beyond the, the boundary that we have today. And uh, uh, back then, there was uh, Von Braun. Von Braun was, uh, uh, was uh, the one that uh, uh, brought the US into space. Um, uh, that, that's 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 life. Uh, space is it's a uh, it's a very complicated uh, arena. Uh, space, aerospace, space. You need uh, to find uh, solutions to something that uh, uh, it's inconceivable for everybody else. So the more you put uh, effort uh, trying to catch up with uh, uh, people like Elon Musk, you waste your time. You need to work with him. You try. You need to. He is currently uh, trying to create an highway to Moon and Mars. The only thing that we need to do is to get on board. Similarly, on the other concept, aircraft that are becoming spacecraft. Um, Richard Branson bought a, a, a beautiful design from Bert Rutan. Um, Italy has an opportunity to get in that type of discussion. But uh, what we need to do is not try to copy other designs, but uh, try to work with them. Okay. Thank you. Obviously, in, I hope that we eventually will have ourselves our own uh, uh, Elon Musk or Bert Rutan in Italy. That's what I hope. And then everybody else will try to uh, jump on board with us. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question is from uh, Martino Pinto. Yeah, so uh, thank you. So, Mr. Vittori, is it possible to uh, become, a, a, let's say, a test pilot or an astronaut uh, for a, an engineer, an aerospace engineering student, or is uh, only possible to, like in most part of the cases, to uh, let's say people with um, avionics background, and is understandable, of course. Um, so the the question, the, sorry, the the first part was the about becoming an astronaut. Yeah, uh, I will repeat. Maybe it's not heard well. So I was saying, is it possible for uh, an uh, aerospace engineering student to become an astronaut, or is it difficult? Uh, and uh, maybe it's more easy if you are with uh, an um, avionic background, an Air Force background. Let's say. Thank you. No, no, that's very possible. It's very possible. In fact, there is uh, as of tomorrow, the European Space Agency uh, is opening a, a new selection for for astronauts. Um, now, engineers are perfect. Uh, currently, back then in the 60s, uh, primarily were test pilots, Neil Armstrong, Alan Shepard, uh, or, or, uh, Yuri Gagarin, but that, that was different. Now, flying to space is uh, it's normal. Um, it is still very expensive, but uh, um, NASA uh, if uh, every two years NASA has a new selection and uh, engineers, in fact, are the majority. Currently, I believe the, 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 the majority of the astronaut population is, uh, is engineers. Pilots are still needed, but uh, um, especially on the new approach of Elon Musk, everything is automatic. So if you, if you look through YouTube, um, already the, the shuttle was, uh, um, the shuttle was automatic up to the landing and the landing was manual. So a, a huge effort on the shuttle side was, um, done by the pilots. If you talk about going to space, 
on a spaceship too of Virgin Galactic, um, you need a pilot and a commander and they have to be pilot as pilots. Then you have uh, the passengers um, that can be obviously anyone else. But that's a Richard Branson approach to tourism that, oh, by the way, I don't believe the tourist uh, approach to space will have a future. Um, the, 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 the beauty of the spaceship too is uh, in anticipation of a transport of future generation more than tourism. But uh, going back to the question, no, engineers uh, currently are probably the majority of the population of astronauts. Thank you. That's very encouraging. <laughs> OK, thanks. We have uh, the last question uh, for again from Professor Armenice. I have to read again. Could you comment on problems with point to point suborbital transport for dual application? Uh, this means civilian and military. Point to point uh, is the next step. Uh, point to point is uh, um, the, the solution of transportation of future generation that today we do not have. Point to point, uh, we, so suborbital, we go to space and we come back. Then uh, if we would have a additional, another engine and additional fuel, we could do a point to point. That is uh, uh, Virgin Galactic with Spaceship 2 is doing step one and step three, step two being the point to point. We were discussing before why um, the aircraft evolving into spacecraft have, have remained uh, standing by for 60 years because of the propulsive e of the engines that we do not have a solution yet. So the point to point uh, is part of that discussion. Uh, if Skylon, will uh, become a reality with uh, Saber, the engine, then uh, the suborbital we will in reality become point to point. Point to point uh, will change completely planet Earth the way we know it today. Elon Musk is trying to get in that discussion of the point to point. And this concept uh, is that uh, Starship can take off go suborbital point to point and land. I believe for this is wrong because uh, um, I do not believe planet Earth as the atmosphere. Moon is different. Mars atmosphere, but it's 100s. Our atmosphere is very dense. I believe for such a perspective, Elon Musk will not succeed in the sense that uh, Point to point, uh, uh, the natural solution for the point to point is the aircraft that is evolving into spacecraft configuration. That is the one that I like the most. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I think that we, we have no more time for additional questions today. Uh, so I give again the word to Roberto for his final remarks. Uh, well, thank you. But in reality, um, <laughs> the, the, the questions ended up uh, uh, underlining uh, what I wanted to share as a conclusive remark. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you my experience uh, and my and the way I see the future. Congratulations to Polytechnic of Bari and uh, all of you for all that you are doing. and. Uh, Anytime, I will always be glad to be with you and to give a contribution. Thank you again. Thanks. I thank Roberto very much again for his interesting seminar and discussion. I thank also all the participants. I'm sure that uh, Roberto Ward's has stimulated curiosity and additional idea. So I can really ask his availability to be contacted uh, directly by you in case. Uh, thanks again to everyone, and I leave the floor to Marco for uh, the final comments uh, uh, or uh, something else, I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you, Caterina, but I cannot add anything more. So, Roberto, I think that uh, I'm not the only one who wanted to have your experience in space. So, even if virtually, I really thank you for letting us participate in your missions. And as, as Caterina said, uh, I really believe that uh, your contribution 
continues to motivate our students uh, to be involved in uh, aerospace science and engineering because, as you say, that could be our next future. So thanks again for, for your contribution and thanks everybody for participating. Ciao. See you.